hello and welcome to decoding your canine we are starting the summit next week but we thought we'd give you a little bit of a a precursor a little bit of a treat um and just for everybody that's a little bit confused because i know there is some confusion the summit interviews will be sent out via email they are not here in this group that anything in this group is just an added extra because i love you guys um, but with me is Kay Stewart from Feed Real, um, and I'm just going to put up your, um, hang on, bear with me, here we go. I hope, I don't know if everybody, I think only maybe people on YouTube can see this, but it's uh, feedreal.com. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's, it's probably easier if I put this one up, feedreal.com, if anybody wants to jump on her website. Kay, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, somebody has just asked um will there be any recording of the slide yes it will be available in this facebook group for as long as you need but if you are here now and you've got a quick question you want to ask hey if you have to shoot off let us know i'm sure she'll be happy to answer it while you're maybe typing that out Kay, um thank you so much for joining us and being the full person the full runner <laughs> for the summit um can you maybe just tell us a little bit about what you do um and who you are uh et cetera, absolutely et cetera. Sure, I am the, I'm a registered veterinary technician and a certified professional canine nutritionist. And I work for Real Dog Box in their um, educational arm, which is the Feed Real Institute. There we have a series of articles on the website, but we also have two courses for dog nutrition and we advocate for fresh whole feeding. It doesn't have to be raw. Some people are really nervous about raw um, we give you a lot of tips on different ways to feed, feed fresh whole food. And like, so we have two courses. One is a dog parent course and it's geared just to that, to dog parents that want to learn a little bit more on how to feed their own dogs, that species appropriate diet, um, but are a little afraid to because there's so much information out there. <laughs> so um, we have that dog parent course. And then we also created a veterinary professional course that mirrors the dog parent course, but is a little bit more technical and a little bit more academic, but it is also race certified, which in the United States means that the veterinarians and veterinary technicians can take the course and receive 10 continuing education credits for taking it. Um, and I'm hoping that that will encourage veterinary staff to come in and take the course, get the CE credits, learn what it is that um, dog parents know that they want to feed the species appropriate diet bridge this gap between what dog parents want and what veterinarians have been taught and start to work together on getting these dogs the species appropriate diet. Brilliant, so we're brilliant. really, really excited. It's the first yeah. course based on fresh food that has uh, race certification. So we are just really, really excited about that. Yeah, yeah. We need more professionals in the industry with a better understanding of, of feeding rule, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. get the message out there. Um, but we have a few questions coming in, so we might dig Thanks. into some of these. So um, this one is from Dave, and he posted it um, uh, earlier in the week, um, and he asks, is it safe to feed raw wild trout that is filleted? Um, and if yes, do the fine pin bones in the lateral line need to be removed? Mm. Yeah, feeding fish to dogs is very, very appropriate. Um, it can be raw, it can be lightly cooked. Um, the bones pose no problem at all. In fact, it's just going to add to their calcium intake. And you don't even have to fillet it. You can just chop it up and give it to them whole. The heads have all of the brains and the eyes that have really, really Yum. good nutrients in them. <laughs> I know we think, oh, that's gross, but the dogs love it. And that's, I mean, a lot of animals will eat that head first and even leave the rest of it um, because they realize that that's where the nutrients are that they really need. Um, so no, giving the whole thing, every bit of it is great for your dog. I, I have got a question around that, but I will say that my dogs are not keen on fish, raw fish. They'll eat the tin sardines, but uh -huh. try to give them a fresh sardine and they're like, yeah, well, two of them will kind of eat it because, well, they just will but they right. not you can tell they're not keen on them and the other one <laughs> is just, yuck but That's the question true. i have is um i'm not sure about trout but what wild fish in the ocean or i don't know is mm -hmm. is wild is that the right word fish wild right. fish in the ocean as opposed to farmed fish what what do we have to worry about the mercury level in some of the bigger fish like 
tuna, for example? Sure. Um, that is a very good question. And yes, you do. So we always recommend the smaller the fish, the better. So really, right. the fish that we recommend our sardines, like you were saying, um, capelin is another one, anchovies, herring, um, I'm missing one that we normally will have in our boxes. Um, and those and that is exactly why these are little fish. They're not out there very long. Um, and they don't get those mercury levels. So we really don't recommend tuna. The biggest mm -hmm. fish we recommend is salmon. And, um, and then again, I wouldn't feed it as, you know, everyday kind of fish, but it's got some really, really good nutrients in it. So some salmon is good, but those little oily fatty fish smelt, that's the other one I was looking for. Um, mm -hmm. Those all have all the nutrients in them and you're not gonna have to worry about those toxic levels of mercury and other metals. Oh, that's really interesting. So trout would be in a river, I take it, or some sort of in, mm -hmm. inland body. Uh, are there things to worry about fish in freshwater then? That, you know, well, some people are concerned, yeah, about parasites. And right. what I would recommend is freezing them for three weeks and then pull them out and feed them raw right. to avoid right. any parasites mm -hmm. so or likely parasite cooking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've heard that about salmon. Yeah. Right. And it depends again on the fish. Like I said, those small oily fishes that I'm talking about that we normally recommend, you don't have to worry about them in them. Um, but, and trout's one that we're like, you know, I would feed my dog probably straight out of the river. Um, some people are more concerned with that. And the same with salmon. Some people are really concerned with um, the Northwest salmon coming out of the Northwest um, United States area. And so they will lightly cook that to avoid the bacteria that causes what they're calling salmon poisoning. Um, we've never seen it. Ruby has fed her dog that for years and has never seen an issue, but we understand that some people are really concerned with it. So lightly cooking those would be a good way to avoid that. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Okay, then we have Marcy and she says or asks, um, if I can't always make raw at home, um, what are some good online resources, especially in the U.S., to get food and treats for my Border Collie? So I have a really hard time um, recommending commercial raw just because there's so many ingredients in those that I really have a hard time with. Some of them still yeah. have a lot of carbs in them. Um, and so I would have to be very, very picky. Um, plus, a lot of them are made by third parties. So the company may say that this is what's in it, but a third party is actually making it. And so oh, they wow. don't really have control over it at that point. So I'm not going to go out on a limb and, and recommend any specific company. There are some decent ones, but, you know, you can look online. But the Real Dog Box, which is who I actually work for, we have all natural air dried treats and chews. And if you get the subscription box of that, there is organ meat and fish and muscle meat every month in there and they're different ones and those muscle meats change every month so you have a variety and you can put those in your dog's meal the other thing you can put in your dog's meal is our meatballs and i don't have a bag of them handy um, but the meatballs are a combination of all six ingredients that we recommend in the ancestral diet which is the raw meaty bones muscle fish organ meat, both um, liver and another secreting organ, and fur for the fiber. Um, what they do is they combine all that, they grind it all, they put it in meatballs, and then we freeze or air dry it. So you have these air dried meatballs, you can reconstitute them with water. Um, my dog is about 33 pounds, we can give her seven in a day. And that can be her entire meal because everything's in those. So I oh always keep bags of meatballs around, even though we always have food in the freezer. It'd be like, oh, I forgot to take food out of the freezer. So I would say once a week, she gets the meatballs for her meals and she loves them. Um, yeah. Some people, like I said, if you're doing road trips, oh, they're, they're perfect for that camping. Um, and they also are really, really good high value treats for training. You break them up dogs mm. love them they're stinky because they have all those components <laughs> in them. so you know your dog's gonna love it <laughs> yeah, the stinkier the better <laughs> exactly and um those is what i would recommend having those on hand um is uh, it, you know like i said there's many times where i'll be like i forgot to take the meals out she gets people so i always have a bag or two of those on hand 
Yeah, oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, Hayley asks, um, how long should you freeze freshly caught rabbits or hares in Australia? Okay, and you mentioned about freezing before, yeah. And I think right. I think um, I think it's Haley, isn't it? Sorry, I've got to keep jumping back into the Facebook group to see who's commenting because it doesn't <laughs> show up. In, and unless you guys put your name, if you're in Facebook for whatever reason, it doesn't show up. So, um, so yeah. So um, I guess you talked about that with the the fish um, mm -hmm. freezing it um, because of the. And I guess Haley, you're talking about the the risk of parasites, and I, I'm right. pretty sure it's the same with. I would, yeah, I would, right. And I am assuming that's about three weeks is what they would tell you. Yeah, that's what yeah. I've heard um, yeah. here, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, in the U.S., um, I know with the rabbits that I get for my dog, I I feed them raw. Um, yeah. They've never been frozen before. So mm -hmm. I guess it would depend on your particular um, supplier, you know, and, and what is, I don't, I honestly don't know what's going on there with your rabbit. Um, but the ones here in the U.S., I get right from the butcher and give them to her that way. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know people do use, do do roadkill as well for kangaroos mm. and things oh, like really? that. Oh, <laughs> really? Possums, you know, possums that have been run over and, mm. yeah. But, I, I mean, would be leery me, with that. <laughs> yeah, well, I couldn't, pers I, I personally yeah. couldn't books blood and gore isn't my thing but um <laughs> but you know they you've got the risk of ticks and things on them right. too as well so mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. plus you're but not quite sure how long they've been down there um you know if it's a fresh kill and you've seen it happen I yeah, guess, fresh you know, kill. yeah right i'd be really careful if you don't know um and i've seen people do that with deer here deer are like your kangaroo here um and it's the same thing a lot of people will get those um the dnr will collect them and and take them to local zoos and things too so um so yeah it depends on how long they've been there yeah yeah um okay so i'm not sure who this is because they must be oh rasa thank you rasa for putting your name there um can you please make a wider comment on feeding raw fish focusing on the risk of parasites um same comment for meat and parasites in raw meat um and how to address them what is the safe levels of freezing what temperature and how long uh -huh. Okay, so like I said, with the small oily fish, we have no requirement for having um, frozen or canned or anything. Um, however, most people do get them frozen because that's how you can buy them. So if that's the case, uh, anytime up to three or at three weeks is when they consider them safe. If you read, you know, in the literature, most of those fish are not going to have parasites that you need to worry about. Um, and the same with the, the meat, depending on where you get it. If you're getting meat that is approved for human consumption, um, human quality, you do not need to worry about parasites in the meat, including pork. And I know that there's been a lot of controversy with pork, but in the recent years that at least in the United States has all been cleared up. And I feed, again, the dog anything raw that I can get. Um, I don't, I, it's usually frozen because that's the way you buy it. Um, but I don't worry about parasites and anything because everything I get is, is approved for human consumption. If you are getting roadkill or like my daughter um, shot a doe and so we had venison and I made sure that we froze all of that for a, a three week period of time. Freezing does not guarantee that all parasites are going to be killed. There are some parasites, like if you get a wild boar, I'd be very careful. There's there's some parasites with that that you really can't kill other than high heat. Um, uh -huh. and, then when, and then you're going with high heat and it's kind of nullifying. I mean, it's still fresh food. It's still better than kibble, but you'd have to cook it as if you're cooking it for yourself to get rid of any parasites. So I would be leery with boar. Um, but other meats, and like I said, with the venison, which... We have an abundance here. Um, we'll, we'll get a deer at least once a year. Um, we just freeze that for the three weeks time. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then somebody, who was this? Uh, Linda. Linda asks, um, talk about feeding puppies. That's a, a, a big conversation. So you probably won't yeah. be able to cover everything. Is, Maybe you yeah. can touch. Well, it is a big conversation because there's a lot of people, even fresh food components, 
or proponents say that you should wait until they're a year to feed them fresh food, which does not make any sense really? to me at all. Yes, I've, I've seen that mom. with some veterinarians. They're like, well, their system just can't handle it. Um, oh, you're not going to get the right ratio. <laughs> I know, I know. You can't handle it all, but that's just appropriate. Never mind that, Yeah, <laughs> so what, we disagree with that. We want to get them started as soon as possible because that establishing that gut microbiome early on is so important. And especially as you're training this puppy, you want that gut microbiome to be very, very solid and producing all of the um, hormones and the feel good, you know, um, neurotransmitters that they need. So what we recommend is that you base it on their age. We have the easiest food calculator, dog food calculator out there at feedreel.com slash calculator. And it, it asks you the dog's age, and then it goes by weight and activity level, and it gives you all the information on how much to feed. So for puppies, we have a little bit higher percentage than you would for adult dogs as far as percentage of their body weight that you're feeding. But we also have higher requirements for bone. We say 17%, which with adults, it's 10 to 12%. And then we also recommend a little bit higher on the um, organ meat, but mainly it's the bones that we want to make sure they're getting enough of. Now, if you have a large breed dog, um, you want to back off and stick to about 15% bone. You don't want to make those bones grow fast. And so that's a whole different conversation is how to feed large and giant breeds to prevent those bones from going too fast and having um, issues with joint problems, um, the disc or um, hip dysplasia, elbow problems that they get. So you really want to be careful with that. But for the most part, if you use that feed real calculator and you can put your puppy's information in there, it'll give you, it'll shoot out exactly what you need um, based on, like I said, age, weight, and activity level of your puppy. But the yeah. biggest thing is adding the extra bone. Yeah, yeah, it's important. Um, somebody just asked if I could put up the website again, so I'll just put yes. that back. So it's feedreel.com and then slash calculator. But when you get to feedreel.com, you'll see um, on the top, there'll be a spot that says calculator. And like I said, it's the easiest. I mean, I use it all the time. The, the, what's really, really nice about that calculator, it, well, there's several things, but it all depends on what bone you have available. So if today I have chicken feet available for my dog, you put that in and it tells you how much weight in chicken feet, how much muscle meat based on the amount of um, muscle meat that's on the bones. So it's all, it takes all that into consideration. It also, well, you can indicate on there that you want to use air dried product from Real Dog Box or wherever you get your air dry product, it'll do that calculation for you. So it's basically 20% of the weight that you would normally have because everything is about 80% water. So we do all that work for you. It also gives you how much of our 50-50 organ mix that you can get that's um, air dried and ground. And that's what I use for our organs um, for our dog. It's 50% liver and 50% other secreting organ, all ground into a nice little pouch and I literally a teaspoon of it into her meal. <laughs> That's all she needs. Um, yeah, yeah. So the calculator gives you all of that information and it can be varied according to what bone you have on hand. And, you know, as, if you have several on hand, you can flip through it and it'll keep changing it for you. Um, but it's all based on what bone you have on hand. Yeah. And I think, um, I forget what I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, if something touched on, oh, anyway, we'll, we'll get, we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to it. We'll, um, we'll probably circle around. So Janelle says high value treats are a must. And that is a big one for, for people that want to feed raw. Mm -hmm. What, how do you, what's your suggestion for that then? So, so one of the things I know, um, beef liver is a very high value treat for dogs. And I think that's great. Uh, but I do want to caution you if you're using it in their meal, if you, plan their meal to have beef liver in it. Keep the beef liver out of the meal and use that for the treats. Treat. You don't want to give too much beef liver because of the copper in it. You don't want to have too much copper in their body. Other liver, like if you're going to do pork liver for their meal, you can still use the beef liver for their treats. Those are really, really high um, value treats. Any of our organ meats that we have in the Real Dog Box have appear to be very high value for the dogs that of people that I know um, that are using them for that purpose. And like I said, the meatballs, they'll crush those up and the dogs love them. Um, 
we also sell um, air dried green tripe, which you talk about smelly, oh. it's horrendous. But no, that's another fish stuff's 10 times yeah, worse. That, that's true. That's, <laughs> true. Um, that's a really high value treat. So there are some really good ones, but especially with these air dried products that we have that are easy for you to use and yeah. still very high value. Yeah. That's what I use. <laughs> and which brings us to a good question um, talking about air dried. So the difference between freeze dried, air dried, and other options. Okay. So with air dried, it's too, yeah, it's just what it says. So we have um, custom made um, the co or the um, the co CEOs or founders of our company actually made these drying bins. There's I think eleven of them in the um, kitchen. I'm trying to think how many that are just like huge, huge closets, and they created everything, and it controls the humidity and the temperature in that room and all the air is pulled out out into the atmosphere then and <clears throat> excuse me and so it basically mimics sun drying and it all depends on what the product is as to how long it takes to air dry it um, and at what temperature we never go above 120 degrees i believe um, so it's never at that threshold where you're starting to lose nutrients. We keep it under that threshold for that reason. And we just go a little longer if it takes a little longer to dry. And some products dry within 24 hours. Some can take three to four days, depending on the thickness, you know, all of that. And so that's air drying. You Minimal, minimal loss of um, any nutrient in there. The, our freeze drying is a little bit different because it, they pull the moisture out and deep freeze it quickly from my understanding. So you're going to have a little bit more um, manipulation of the product, but again, it's not gonna be high heat. It's still very good as far as that goes, but freeze drying also makes things very brittle. And so you're, you're gonna get with a lot of powder at the bottom of your bag or whatever it is that you have. And some people don't like that. Um, I've seen that complaint for freeze dried raw that people will say, well, it was all powder at the bottom. Well, that's kind of a consequence of freeze drying. Um, and usually dogs don't like that as well unless you reconstitute it. Again, it's a dog preference. Um, reconstitute meaning adding with some water. water. Mm -hmm. Water or bone broth or, you know, something to bring it back to its natural, mm -hmm. natural state. And you can do that with the air dried also. Um, and then uh, I thought of some, oh, dehydration. Dehydration is a little bit different than air drying because dehydration is an active process and it does go above the 160 degree heat um, parameter, which does start, lose, start to lose some of the nutrients. So I personally think that the air dried is the least manipulative, the least amount of processing. We literally cut the pieces and put them on an air drying rack and put them in a room. Um, freeze drying is a little bit more manipulation because it literally sucks some of that moisture out as it's going into the deep freeze. Um, but again, it's not going into high heat. It's not, you're not going to lose the nutrients. Um, and then the dehydrator is going to lose some of the nutrients. So um, if you're adding water to reconstituting freeze dried, do you also reconstitute air dried or is that not necessary? You can. And, and some okay. dogs, yeah. And, and we recommend that, especially for the meatballs, if that's all you're giving them for the day, because it just kind of gives them a little bit longer to eat them. Um, mm. And some dogs just don't really want them all crunchy like that. Now, the dog that I have, she really likes them hard and crunchy. So I just toss them in her bowl. So really, you know, your dog is going to tell you what it wants and yeah. what it doesn't want. Yeah. Um, so, guys, if you've got any questions, please ask them now while we've got Kay with us. Um, but I have a question for you, Kay. Sure. So type, get typing now. <laughs> for, <laughs> but I have a question about um, the hormones that uh, are they, you know, put into meat. Are they put into meat or not? So, in other words, you know, you talk about chicken. Uh, do they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, so you're, you're talking about like food. growth hormone and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So is that a concern? It is a big concern, and I think um, that's one of the things when we talk about the proteins that we offer in our boxes, and when we recommend people getting what proteins they get, we always recommend um, grass-raised, pasture-raised meats that are organically raised if possible. 
um, because of those hormone injections or antibiotics that might be residual in their body. So the cleaner you can get the meat, the better quality. And not only that is they're going, grass fed animals are going to have a lot more nutrients in their meat. For one thing, they're moving around, they're eating the grass, the soil. And so they're getting the natural um, nutrients that they would normally get. They have higher levels of vitamin E and vitamin A in that meat. They have higher levels of zinc, um, higher antioxidants. It's just better meat in those animals. So farm lot uh, or, you know, the big factory farms, those animals are basically kept in very small areas. They're fed grain. Um, they're just not fed their natural food um, and they're not able to move around. And so that muscle meat isn't as tender, isn't as good, you know, overall. Um, and you can have some residual antibiotics in that meat and you can, cause it's a threshold, at least in the States, there's a threshold of, it can't be higher than this parts per million, but that doesn't mean there's nothing in there. Mm -hmm. Um, for somebody, I'm very, very sensitive to antibiotics. There's very, very few I can take. And if oh, wow. I've had a burger from somewhere, um, inevitably I can tell if wow. it was a lower quality because my stomach just doesn't like it at all. <laughs> so wow. I try not to. Um, and I don't find that as much in chicken. I don't think they use the growth hormone as much in chicken. Um, but again, the, the meat is just so much more, um, it's much healthier. It has a lot more nutrients. It's just better overall yeah. for you. It's, and it's your dog. Hard. I mean, um, I, I used to stock a, a product that's available over here called Organic Paws um, for dogs. Mm -hmm. a raw raw feeding um and it's just so expensive you know mm -hmm. for people that really want to go down that road it's right. just so expensive to go organic yeah and we understand that and we always say you know you have to do what you can do you know the the if you can't afford organic then that's fine then do the next level and you're mm -hmm. still still so much better than if you're feeding kibble um, so anything you can add, and even if you can't do hundred percent, just add it to the kibble and anything fresh that you can. Um, and you have to Touch be comfortable. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, we are not the kind of company that says it's all or none. You need to be comfortable with it. You need to, um, feel like you're getting the value that you need out of it. Um, and there's no shame if you can't do it hundred percent. Absolutely no shame. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm not sure who commented this because they might be in the other Facebook group. <laughs> so we're zooming into two Facebook groups. Um, is there a maximum percentage of crude protein an adult dog should get on a daily basis? What's the best value to aim for? Okay. Um, so if you're going with the raw, again, if you use our calculator, you're going to get um, a readout of everything you should add. And it's going to equal close to 80% protein by the time you add the fish in. So our, pro, our, our calculator is going to tell you um, about raw meaty bones, about muscle meat, the, the two different organs, fish and fur or some other kind of um, fiber. And so with the uh, muscle meat, we say 63 to 65%, but the fish we're saying 10%, that's almost all protein too. So we are talking about about 80% of the meal. Now this is um, not, this would be with all of the moisture in it. So 80% of that is moisture. Um, so if you want to do your calculation as to how much crude protein that is, and off the top of my head, I don't have that in my head. Um, but we are going on the fact that you want to have at least close to 80% of the meal being protein of some kind. Hmm. It's a lot, isn't it, really, when you think about it? It really um, is. Uh, and, and part of that protein or, or um, muscle meat is also going to contain the fats. So let me back up. That's not going to be all protein. That is going to also contain the animal fats. So it's a combination of the two. Mm. And um, now they're saying it's usually like a 45 or 55% protein, 45% fat, somewhere in there um, of those components. So you do want some healthy good animal fat in there. When you're first transitioning a dog with animal fat, you want to back off and give the leaner meats because their system isn't ready for a lot of fat. Um, so mm. I use a lot of beef heart because that's something I can get very easily. And that's not an organ. It's a muscle meat. 
because the heart is a muscle. Um, and that it is a lot of fat surrounding the heart and that comes with it when I get it. So my dog doesn't do real well with a lot of fat. She it gives her some soft stools, some like soft mucousy stools. So I trim a lot of that fat off and toss it out back for the chickens because they eat everything. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> chickens eat everything. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, so, I think of them as being like meat eaters. Do you? <laughs> oh, they'll eat chicken. I mean, they'll eat oh, anything. We, we, pretty Cannibal. much anything we put out there, they they'll eat. They're, they're hilarious. Well, you, they'll eat each other if one dies. So, oh gosh. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're too much information. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so we, uh, I've got, oh, so, so with her, I don't put all that fat in. Some yeah. dogs do really well with it. And fat is, is a very, very good en energy source. They get twice the amount of energy in fat than they do in protein. Um, and so especially if you have a very active dog, putting a little extra fat in their meal, it's good for their skin. It's good for a lot of other things, as long as it's good quality animal fat. So uh, talking about fat, I'm just, sorry, I'm making notes as you talk. No so it's jogs questions about what, I'm, what I want to lead on to with a question. Um, when you're talking about fat, is there that danger of pancreatitis? Like how careful do we have to be with mm -hmm. that? Sort of, um, well, you know, there's a lot of, there's conversation around pancreatitis in dogs. Um, yes, if they eat a huge amount of fat all at once, like I knew somebody's dog who got into a five pound bottle or five pound bucket of lard that they had set aside for oh birds for the winter. The dog, yeah, did not make it. Um, oh God. Yeah, it was horrible. But so yeah, that body just could not deal with that. Oh, However, yeah, the, the problem that they're really seeing or recognizing now, it's not just fat causing pancreatitis. It's what is causing the pancreas to work so hard. And with kibble, that's all those extra carbohydrates. So dogs that are on kibble are already working overtime to get that kibble process because their pancreas has to produce the amylase that normally in most um, mammals is in your saliva. It's not in dogs. So their pancreas really has to work overtime. And then you add an influx of fat on top of that and the pancreas just can't deal with it. There's just too much going on. So really studies are showing it's not as much of a fat problem, it's a, a metabolic problem with the fact that dogs are getting kibble with too much carbohydrates in it and those carbs are causing the issue. It's that constant day-to-day -day processing of the carbs. Then they get a fatty treat or a meal and it just throws them into acute pancreatitis. That's really interesting because, you know, you hear people saying, oh, I've got a dog with pancreatitis, I can't possibly feed raw. And, right. in fact, what you're saying is the absolute opposite. Totally opposite, exactly, yes. Um, and, and if you do have a dog that has pancreatitis, while it's on raw, um, obviously a little bit too much fat was given at some point, we just recommend really um, giving leaner meats during that time, backing off a little bit, as minimal fat as possible. Um, and then doing some things like pumpkin or, or something that'll soothe that stomach and make it easy, anything easy to digest. Um, and that does not mean chicken and rice because that is not easy to digest. That's another one yeah. of the myths that we debunk. Um, rice is actually very inflammatory and it's carbohydrates and it's hard for the dog <laughs> to, it's hard for the dog to digest. So then you're just adding to the problem of pancreatitis if you give those high, uh -huh. high um, levels of carbs. Yeah, blowing so. the mind. That's um, <laughs> really isn't that what they say to give when your dog's feeling poorly, chicken and rice? Yeah, we have a full article on that in the um, dog course, the dog nutrition course, both levels, basically debunking that because there's so many things wrong with just chicken and rice. And the fact that you're giving it to a dog who's already have an upset stomach and having a hard time digesting that's not easy for them to digest and then on top of it they're not getting very many nutrients out of it so yeah, yeah. Not what we're um, so the next question actually I, i've got here on my little list anyway but um, <laughs> so i'm gonna put it here i it's it's the whole yin yang thing you know you hear about so you, you i think what jogged my memory and possibly for this 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 person that's commented uh -huh. and i'm not sure who did it because i'm probably in the other group which i don't have open but um you know, you mentioned about feeding leaner meats, and I know mm -hmm. um, 
my understanding here in Australia is like obviously kangaroo is a leaner meat, but it can actually be quite heating. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's that whole, you know, you see those charts with the yin yang, these foods are heating, these foods are cooling. Where do you sit on that? Well, I think, um, I think it's valid. I don't personally know that much about the Chinese medicine and, and all of that, but they do say that certain meats are cooling. And what that means is it just doesn't take the body as much to process them. The body can, it, it can cool the body down because it's not hard to process. Um, it's the way energetically it works with the body is what is called is the cooling part of it. Um, and I have that list but not on the top of my head, um, of which proteins are, <laughs> sorry, uh, which ones are heating and cooling, but, um, like chicken is definitely a, a hot protein and, um, but Turkey is a little bit cooler. Mm -hmm. And so, and then rabbit is considered a cooler protein. I don't know where kangaroo falls. I don't think that was in our chart. It's a heating one. My yeah, understanding is heating. Okay. Heating yeah. 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 And so, um, there is an article that I have that lists those, like I said, off the top of my head, I can't pull up all the, um, the ones that are on it. But if you have a dog that's constantly running hot, so they're constantly seeking cool places, they're panting a lot, they have a lot of redness around their face, um, that would be a dog that would benefit from some cooling proteins. But there's probably something else going on too. I would check for hypothyroidism thyroidism, I would check for, um, you know, see if you're giving enough omega threes so that the omega three and omega six balance is correct. Um, so that you've got because omega sixes are inflammatory, omega threes are anti inflammatory. So if you don't have the right ratio, you can get a lot of inflammation and then that way the body's hot. So there's a lot of things going on with that rather than just cool and warm proteins. Um, but it definitely is something to look at if you've got a dog that's constantly hot or constantly cold, a dog that's constantly seeking heat. Again, you might want to check and see if there's some issues going on with that dog, too. Yeah, that's interesting. And I know like Rottweilers um, are quite prone to hot spots. And that one behind me on the wall was very, um, he was he was just, a, he just felt the heat, you know, like he would be more inclined to go and lie on the tiles. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think I was really cautious about what about feeding kangaroo because you know every yeah. time he, he might have a flare up or something like that. So yeah. And again, that knowing your own dog is huge. Yeah. Because again, it could be a, a hot protein for one, and maybe just a warm or partially cooling protein for another. Um, there are definitely some specific parameters on how those energies work in the body, but every dog is different. And yeah. so you really need to know your dog. Yeah. And Sally says Rue is heating, but also good for heat damp diet. Mm. Um, and who commented this one? Okay. I'm not sure who commented this one. Um, what's a good protein meal for a dog with hypo? Uh, my dog is being tested for it at the moment. Okay. So I'm assuming you mean hypothyroidism. So with that dog, you're going to obviously need to see if, a supplement is needed, but you'll want to a balanced diet that is going to provide all the hormones that the dog needs is going to be really important. One of the things you can feed is neck bones because there's sometimes thyroid in there and that will actually help with hypothyroid dogs. One, when we, one of the things we tell people, if you are feeding a lot of neck, like turkey neck, chicken neck, rabbit neck, um, that you should always have the thyroid tested every year when you're doing annual um, blood work because there is the possibility of too much thyroid in those. If you have a hypothyroid dog, those would be a good product to get because then you're gonna get some natural thyroid in there. Right, and so, so then someone else has said, what about hyperthyroid? Hyperthyroid, um, you'd wanna definitely avoid the neck uh, in those cases and Again, once you start getting all of the rest of the body regulated with all of the raw diet parameters or components, you may see that hyperthyroid actually diminish. But that's something you need to work with your veterinarian um, and mm -hmm. keep checking the levels and, and keep track of that. Okay. Um, Holly comments. 
Oh, and someone else said, sorry, they said thank you very much. Appreciate okay. it. <laughs> should put that up. Um, Holly comments, I give my dog omega-3 and vitamin E for his dry skin. Now I'm wondering if I shouldn't be using a cooler protect protein or omega-6 in addition to the omega-3. Okay, so with um, itchy skin and dry skin, I'm, I think the best option are these small oily fish, not necessarily omega-3 oils. The problem with fish oils is they oxidize very quickly. As soon as you open that container, you're getting some oxidation and that weakens the omega-3. Um, that's why it's so low in kibble is because of the heat processing and then the storage. There's so little omega-3 left and that's why we always say add omega-3. Don't add omega-6 because that's going to throw the balance back off. Um, you want to get the the ratio correct, which is four to one, omega six to omega three. It's not one to one. And a lot of people get confused with that. They yeah. think, well, there's too much omega six if it's four to one, but that's what the body needs. You that's still need inflammation. Told, um, a vet told me, this is like last year, uh -huh. um, I think it was six to three or something. There's a lot of, we Different. go with five to one and four to one. Um, the NRC guidelines and AFCO are way like 26 to one or 30 to oh, one. Wow. I mean, it's ridiculous. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Um, and that is just way, way off. So my recommendation for this dog is try actual oily fish. The vitamin E, you can continue uh, giving a supplement, although I always recommend giving whole food supplements instead of anything unnatural. Um, so with vitamin E, any of the, the good meats have a, a good level of vitamin E. Raw eggs or even slightly cooked eggs are great for vitamin E. Um, if you do want to give raw eggs, I don't know there. Do you guys have to wash your eggs to sell them there? No. Do you know? Okay. <laughs> so oh, you I mean, leave no, out on well, I know there's plenty of people that sell, you know, have chooks and sell their eggs and right. then. They've always so got like food. at the grocery <laughs> store. Yeah, at the grocery store, do they have to be sanitized? Oh, I, yeah, I think they are in the stores. Okay. I don't know if so, they have to, but they definitely are. Yeah, see, in the United States, you have to put them in these sanitizing solutions. And then so we say with those, don't give any egg shells. But with right. the, the backyard farmer eggs or, you know, the ones that you get off a truck, they can have the egg shell too. And that's got some nice extra calcium in it. And, and the, the, that membrane that's on the shell has great glucosamine, chondritin, collagen. I mean, all that stuff is so good for the dog. But you don't want to give those store-bought eggs if you guys have to clean them. And like I said, I know here, in order for them to be sold in the grocery store, they have to be sanitized. And so you don't know how much of that seeps into the shell. So I wouldn't use those. Since we're talking about eggs, there is there are some people that think you only should feed the yolk. Yeah, and because you know, of the a kind of myth about all oh, keep away from the whites of the eggs. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, I, I think, I don't know where that came from, but it's biotinase that's in there. And if you cook it very, very lightly, it, it will um, break that up. And that's when your egg turns white. So some people are more comfortable with that. And if that's something you worry about, you know, that's not a problem. But the less you process an egg, the more you're going to get from it. Um, so I, I, so I feed raw eggs almost every day to the little dog that I have mm -hmm. and she loves them. Um, and it, you know, it really depends on everything. Everybody has comfort levels. And so you can read about that. People will say, don't feed it. Um, but the science that I've seen behind it is saying it's fine. The whole egg. Yeah. I feed the whole egg too. Um, and we've got, he is currently on a diet and is only losing fur, a bit of a guessing game, seeing a dermatologist Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, with that losing fur, it could be a zinc, um, issue. It could be a copper issue. Uh, so these are things in a, a hair, um, tissue mineral analysis might be something that really helps a dog like that. But I would, you know, look into some of these I'm trying to think of the vet, they, the hair tissue analysis is what's best to determine all of those different mineral levels. So if you don't get satisfaction from the vet or the dermatologist, you might want to think about doing one of those. 
Um, Parsley Pet is one of the names of those. I think there's a couple other ones out there now. And we, I'm not sure who this person, oh, Julie, thank you, Julie. Uh, Vet put my puppy now too on science diet, ID turkey, and I'm weaning her off. She now gets a quarter of a can daily. I add cooked meat, veggies, and a nutritional topper. I would like to stop the canned food, but I'm worried about her nutritional needs. She needs a lower fat diet. Okay. So, um, so I, again, would really push to look on the feed reel calculator and see exactly by weight how much you should be feeding her. Um, and then when you look at the muscle meat requirement, always pick your really lean muscle meats to feed. And that should be able to do it. Um, you just trim the fat, you know, you can, if you're worried about too much fat in the fish, you can give, you know, smaller amounts of fish, the air dried fish may not be quite as fatty, but I would worry more about the muscle meat fat. That'll be a telemarketer. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, I would just worry about giving nice lean muscle meats in that case. Um, yeah. Can, can we, can we, no, yeah, uh, let's not go there. Um, <laughs> let's talk about bones because you've got edible bones and you've got recreational bones Correct. and then um, you've got those, weight, you've got weight-bearing bones, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, we're told that um, it kind of always worries me when you see those in the butchers, yeah. these great big bones about this big with the marrow <laughs> down the middle, so yeah. full of fat. Um, and their weight bearing bones, and they've been split in two. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking, oh, there's no way I'd buy that for my dog. But, um, but, but, can you talk a little bit about that? So, sure. sure. So, definitely, when I'm talking about raw meaty bones, we're talking about the edible bones. And edible bones. so, that is the bones that you know, chicken bones are really good because they're soft. They're a lot of a lot of air in there. Um, most dogs, even very small dogs, can chew through chicken bones, chicken feet, um, chicken wings even the um, chicken legs. And then the bigger dogs can get into even like the short ribs on the cow, um, oxtail, turkey and chicken frames, um, rabbit, rabbit meat or rabbit frames are really good. Rabbit legs, those are easy to chew. Um, and so we're talking about bo bones that aren't really hard. Those are your edible bones. When we're talking about recreational bones, we're talking about knuckle bones, and stuff that is a little bit bigger, they can really get in there and gnaw on and, and get some good mental stimulation, some jaw exercises, and just really work at that. And that's so good for their teeth. The raw meaty bones are too, but those recreational bones, they really enjoy it. I mean, they'll chew on them, you know, for a long time. <laughs> what, what I want to say with those though, is you need to know your dog. Again, we said earlier, know your dog. So if you have mm -hmm. a dog that's a gulper and it's just going to gulp down those and it's going to swallow yeah. big pieces, you need to be really careful. And we, there are actual things you can buy that you can hold the bone with, but vice grips work great. <laughs> just hold the bone with a vice grip, hand it the dog, you hold on to it, you control how much they eat. Oh my God. Uh, and you then you take it away. <laughs> yeah. Then you can yeah. take it away. Um, so again, you have to know your dog and especially if they're new to it and then like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I'm going to chomp the whole thing down. So you really want to be careful with yeah. that. Um, and you want to give it according to size. Like you don't want to give a whole turkey wing to a little dog because yeah, it may sit there and chew on it until it's done, but that's way too much for a little dog. So, you know, you, you have to use common sense and you have to know your dog. Um, but I recommend for any of them that you don't know what they're going to do with it for the first time, supervise their chewing. If you're afraid they're going to just gulp it down, use something to hold on to it, you know, that you can hold on to it with them. Take it yeah. away after 10, 15 minutes um, and teach them basically that it's okay. It's not going to go away. You know, I mean, some of these dogs, if it's that first time, that's a high value treat and they, they want it and they want to keep it all for themselves. So you have to really work with those dogs, but some dogs are very methodical. They'll just really chew on those and um, you take it up after a while. And then once all the good stuff is gone and there's just some chunks of bone, throw that away. Mm -hmm. Those marrow yeah. bones, yeah, mm -hmm. those big femurs. So those are the weight-bearing bones on the big animals. Um, you don't want to just give them one of those. I mean, you can buy those intact and they, people will, and especially ones that have been smoked. So now they're really, really, really hard and they're just going to break their teeth on those. Yeah. Um, 
So the one butcher that I go to, he slices those in half and I can give them to her and she just gets all that marrow out and then I take the rest and throw it away. Oh, um, okay. So again, you're gonna watch your dog, let it chew it a little mm -hmm. bit. When it's done, it's done, you take it away. But yeah. those weight bearing bones, yes, those are hard. And especially these ones that have been smoked and cooked. And I mean, those are just an accident waiting to happen. I think deer antlers are too hard on their teeth too. That's like chewing oh, on cement. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it really depends, like I said, all along, it depends on your dog, but you don't want to set them up for failure of breaking their teeth or swallowing too big of a piece or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. At Real Dog Box, we actually have... Um, pig trotters and lamb trotters and they're they're a good size um and but they're still the smaller part of their foot that you know basically they their wrist. Size ones? Uh, air dried we air, air dry them mm -hmm. and a lot of the dogs will eat a lot of it off there and leave some of the bigger pieces and we just say throw those away but there's a lot of connective tissue and a lot of um, tendons and ligaments that really get into those teeth and clean them out um, they're great for their joints. So you just, you know, be careful what you buy, but yeah. the recreational bones are really good for them. That, that leads me to the question of those pig's ears, not the fresh raw ones and the rawhide products. Right. I mean, they're treated, aren't they? Yes. So anything that is white <laughs> is not good because that's been bleached. It's been treated. Um, the pig ears that are smoked have been treated and smoked. Um, and I know dogs love them, but yeah. you're better yeah. off if you can find like, and we do the air dried ones. We do air dried, um, cow ears with the fur right on them. And nice. the dogs <laughs> absolutely love them. We do pig skin. We do pig ears. Oh, I know. They, it's, they just love them. Um, and a lot of people will use those, even the pig ears as a lickable or a chewable lick plate. They'll put their meal on it, give them the whole oh, thing, cool. eat their meal. They get the, the plate to chew on <laughs> and <laughs> the whole big thing. You know, they can freeze parts of it. So instead of the lick mats, you use those, freeze some kefir on there, yogurt or, you know, whatever. Um, you can use that as a treat on top of as a food bowl. So that's cool. But yes, anything white and smoked and cooked at the pet store, stay away. And I'm sure you all know never to give rawhides. Um, and there's still so many out there. How, how do we get that message out to people that raw oh, hides are dangerous? Oh, it's oh, they're just toxic, full of toxins. They're yeah. Full of toxins, and they're, they're just an accident. I, when I, I've only worked in a vet clinic for a total of about three years because I was in research before this job. Um, but even then, I probably saw 30 surgeries in three years' time of taking raw hides out of intestinal tracts. Oh, is that right? Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's so. terrible. Wow. Um, I'm not sure this is, um, can you treat anxiety in dogs with food? Um, oh, just so everybody knows, um, some of the speakers do are talking specifically about the gut microbiome, people right. like Noel Cook, um, people like um, Dr. Holly Gantz. Right. Um, and we do talk about how um, food and behaviour are interrelated and the gut-brain connection right. and access. So that might be a better question. I mean, I'm happy if you want to. Do well, we can time. address it. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the like you said, it's the um, gut brain axis that is helping with anxiety through food. So if you feed the dog to have a healthy gut microbiome, which means that it has the bacteria that is beneficial rather than the ones that are not, um, you are going to have dogs that have all of the right neurotransmitters in them that help them reduce anxiety. So 90% of the serotonin that the dog needs in their brain is produced in the gut by these beneficial bacteria. So if you do not have a healthy gut, you're not getting the serotonin that the dog needs. Anxiety levels are high, trainability is low. Um, so that's where raw feeding comes in for trainability. You want to get that gut very much balanced. And um, Holly will talk to you about that with, I'm sure with uh, Animal Biome is that's where you would send it off. They help you look at what's going on in that gut. What do you need to feed to get the right um, bacteria to grow and the wrong bacteria to be basically um, forced out as, you, as the good bacteria grows, the bad bacteria gets forced out. Um, there's also some other therapies you can do, but absolutely when you can do that, um, 
through food. And if it's a very, very anxious dog or a dog that has been like a rescue dog that, or a fighting dog, I think that's the very first thing you do is get that gut microbiome checked and get started on the path to getting that healthy. And then you worry about training that dog yeah. because until then their mind just can't, they, they can't, they, yeah, they're in a exactly. fog. They're in yeah, a fog. Yeah. That's fascinating. It was such a big conversation. But, um, I mean, the same applies for allergies because they say allergies start in the gut as well, don't Absolutely. they? So we start addressing that and then, yeah. Right. So once you get that gut microbiome settled down, it, it, it um, closes all the gaps in that leaky gut syndrome. You don't have those gaps where things leak out into the rest of the body. That's what causes allergies. Those, those foreign um, particles shouldn't be there. So the body goes in and attacks and then you've got this whole cascade of inflammation and, and all these other issues. So the gut is where it all starts. Yeah. Gut health is, if we don't have good gut health, we don't have good health overall. And I like it you said we because it includes yes. us. Isn't Absolutely. It? <laughs> Not yes, that, every, you know, it's easy to overlook the isn't it? Yeah. Well, everything we know about the gut, you know, they, they, they're applying it to humans and dogs. So yeah. it's a huge yeah. conversation in human medicine. Yeah. So. Um, so Marcy is asking about collagen. Okay. So collagen is actually great for not only skin, um, but also the joints. So you want to give food that has collagen in it. I was talking about those pig and lamb trotters that we um, have at Real Dog Box. Those have tons of collagen, but so does chicken feet. Um, anytime you can get tracheas, aortas, any parts like that that have all the collagen still in them. Um, ears have a lot of collagen, you know. Um, so any of those that have collagen in them is going to be good collagen for the dog to then use in their joints and collagen areas that, that they need it. Um, green lip muscles are really good for that too. And also, they also have chondritin and um, glucosamine, but they're really good for the same type of issues. So, and that's out of New Zealand the, where we get ours. So right down there by you, <laughs> um, yeah. At Real Dog Box, we get them and grind them and, and sell them as a powder so that you can just add them to the dog's meal. That's good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. it's important. So, yeah. Um, I think that's about it. Um, we haven't got any more questions. Um, okay. We've been going for an hour. So, <laughs> bad, that's it? Yeah. No, I went really well. Um, yeah. So, Kay, thank you so much for joining us. I'm just going to put your website up again for anybody that wants to jump on there and um, educate themselves so feedreal.com and we have um, the dog uh, the canine courses um, we have the, the calculator like I said is the easiest one you'll ever need to use um, and we have a, a lot of articles on there if you want to just read through what some of it's behind a paywall um, because of the courses and things but there are some free articles also um, and membership information uh, we also have a workshop that we do, a live workshop that shows you how to create your meals. Uh, and that's, I have people from all over the world join me on that each yeah, month. Yeah. So. And, and what I like is, you know, the idea for some people of feeding raw can be quite daunting and overwhelming and where do I start? But you guys right. make it really, really easy to take that first step. Yes. Yes, yeah. it can be very daunting. <laughs> so Right, but you guys make it so simple, you know. Well, that's why, you know, these last two years, that's all I've done is, is make content that is factual, based on science, but applicable. And that's my, yeah. my main thing about teaching. It has to be ap applicable. You have to walk away saying, I can do this. And that's why yeah. I love the workshop is because yeah. it takes everything that you've learned and puts it to your hands. Yeah. So. Yeah. so there's a, a few fake thank yous. I won't bother putting them up, but lots of lots of people Great. saying thank you. Um, thank you. And me too. So <laughs> thank <course>. you. <laughs> um, and yeah, everybody stay tuned. Um, I'm not sure what day your interview is airing. I think it was day one, it said. Day one, it might, may yeah. well be. But yes, yeah, so everybody make sure. Oh, hang on, we've got another question. Wait, wait. Oh, go ahead. And, uh, carbohydrates in vegetables and skin irritation. So that's why you don't want to feed the real starchy vegetables. So you want to stay away from the sweet potatoes, potatoes, yams, that kind of stuff because of the starch and the extra carbohydrates. The leafy greens are amazing for dogs. Um, green peppers, broccoli, kale, I mean, all those different ones. 
Carrots are a little starchy. A little bit is okay. But again, that's a starchy vegetable, which is why dogs like it because it's really sweet. <laughs> My dog that doesn't like any vegetables will eat carrots. And that's because it's more sweet. Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Katie, okay. for joining You're us. welcome. It was great to be here. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone.